because Jesus, after uh, the conversation that he had with Nicodemus, he, he's gone, and, and as his travel from there going to the next place where he was going, he actually, his disciples decided to go around Samaria, and Jesus said, nah, I'm going through it. And, and so when he went through it, he came to a place, he was thirsty and tired, sat down. Well, the place that he sat down by was a very famous place. It wasn't just any old place. And you need to understand things. With God, there are no coincidences. When God moves, it is deliberate and for a reason. So Jesus stops by this place, and it's called Jacob's Well. And while he's there sitting, there comes a lady. A lady who was not um, very church going. In uh, some churches today, matter of fact, she would not be welcome. But with Jesus, she was welcome. So he's sitting there, and it's in the middle of the day. The sun's coming down, and it is hot. And this lady comes with her bucket to draw water. She sees Jesus there, and she recognizes he is not like her. She is a Samaritan. He is a Jew. The conversation begins to strike up, and Jesus is telling her, woman, if, if you knew who you were talking to, you would have asked me to give you water, a water that you would never thirst again. And she says, how in the world can, I get, can you offer me any water? You only have a bucket. He says, no, what I give you will get, is enough to get you through this living water. And as the conversation continues to go on, you find a transformation that took place with this woman as you continue to go on. But there was a comment that she made when Jesus was talking to her about worshiping. And, and she says, well, you know, you tell us, you're Jewish, and you guys go to the temple and you worship. We're Samaritans. We go to the mountains to worship. And, and Jesus says, there's going to come a time when you're not going to go to the mountain. You're not going to go to the temple. But you're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And we begin to under, try to understand as we were talking Wednesday night about worship and what, what is that. And, with, and Romans chapter 12 talks about that and, and talking about the way it, it goes. And so here's the point that I want you to understand that we're going to talk about this morning. Last week we talked about collide. And collide means that your values and the world's values are not going to be in sync. If you've been watching any of the news lately, ladies and gentlemen, you're watching values collide. The values of the church and the values of the world are colliding. There is a point to be made that nobody is... It, I'm not going to say nobody. Very few people are making. You're seeing all of this uproar and upheaval that is, that is happening in the colleges. Who goes to college generally? Kids straight out of high school. Okay? Okay. 18, 19 years of age. Most of the time, their values and their structures have been made or they're being made. The problem that is arising is when you see these kids, they are very easy to be led 
But let me share a little point with you. And that is this. They arrested, and I don't know exactly how many that they arrested, but let's say just for sake of argument, they arrested 500 people. You know how many of those people actually were part of that college or college us? Roughly about maybe 200 of them. 40%, 60% were not affiliated with those colleges. 60% of them last summer was protesting something else. The summer before, they were protesting something else. The summer before, they were protesting something else. They are being paid to start these movements. And these kids are being suckered in. And you want to know why? Because parents today are saying, Let the child raise themselves. I'll give them a tablet. I'll give them a phone. And where do they get their values? TikTok and Facebook and any other social media. And if you've ever seen TikTok, it's a mess. I got somebody now that's trolling me on Facebook. And they're always sending me the pictures. It's really weird because I have no clue who they are and I can't find out who they are. And it's like, why do I always want to see a child nursing at a mother's breast? I'm, if they're sending it to me, guess who else they're sending it to? Okay? Okay. So all of the porn sites now have now have to have to put up a disclosure for anybody that clicks in it. It's a law, and they have to state that as soon as they get in there, that they're 18 years of age. Who's checking? Nobody. So you've got a six-year-old that can get into a porn site because all he has to do is click, I'm 18, and he's in. And these are the values, and you know why these are the values? Because parents no longer come to church. And the kids are raising themselves. And the United States, as my mama used to say, is going to hell in a handbasket. And ladies and gentlemen say, well, it won't be long. It's already here. Don't ask about it's around the corner. It's here now. And so what we need to understand is as Christians, we need to set a standard that is God's standard and don't move it. And when we talk about being transformed, here's the idea that we want to give you this morning, and that is this. You and I were sinners. And when we came to Christ, ladies and gentlemen, he rescued us from a life, or let's rephrase. He rescued us from death to give us life. Okay? And when he did that, he began a process that is going to take us from where we were to a life that is secure and centered on him. Okay? He's bringing us from where we were 
to a life that is centered and secured on him. I hear people say this all of the time. Well, Jesus loves you just the way you are. Let me say this to you. Yes, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you more because he's trying to move you from where you are or where you were to where you need to be. Jesus is not saying, and this is the thing that a lot of people want to say, and we do it all of the time, you need to understand that Jesus loves you just the way you are. Yes, he does. Jesus is not asking you for anything because the problem is when you try to start changing yourself, you can't. But when you give your life to him and allow him to start the process of changing you and get out of the way, then what he's going to do is he loves you too much to leave you where you were. Okay? He loves you too much to leave you where you were. That's why he says, as we'll begin to start in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is what you need to understand. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, So please understand, even Jesus recognizes there is male and female, okay? And he isn't just using the masculine part of the word. He's making sure he's got everybody included. Brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, in view of what he brought you from and where he's taking you to. He says, I urge you, King James, I beseech you. I like this word, because why? God is prodding you. He isn't just giving you a choice to just stay where you are. God is doing some shoving, ladies and gentlemen, and when Do you understand this, that when the urge hits you, you need to do something about it? I urge you to what? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Lord? And what do you do at the temple? You offer up your sacrifice. So guess what he's saying? I ask you to present your bodies, yourself, as a living sacrifice. Put it on the altar, baby, and give it to me. It's what he's saying to you. As a living sacrifice. Not just a living sacrifice that's maimed, but a living sacrifice that is holy. Who makes you holy? Yeah. Jesus makes us holy to God because it is his blood that he's seeing our sacrifice through. That you present it holy and pleasing to God. Let me say this to you and repeat it again so you won't forget it. Jesus loves you just the way you are but the way you are is not pleasing to God. So what Jesus is trying to do is get you into shape so that when you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, it is holy and acceptable. God does make unholy, unacceptable sacrifices, ladies and gentlemen. I get so sick and tired of people who haven't been in church for years putting out on Facebook, I need you to pray for me. Yell, and you don't want what I'm praying for you. Because it ain't that God will just bless your heart because what I'm trying to say is God would motivate your soul so that you would see where you're at and move it where you should be. 
Because, ladies and gentlemen, these people that say on Facebook and everything else that they're the best Christians in the world, and you never, ever see them talking about church or being with other believers, ladies and gentlemen, they are doing exactly what Satan wants them to do that God warned us about. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as such do or the manner of such are, even as you see the day approaching. Ladies and gentlemen, if it ain't approaching, churches should be full. And guess what? Churches are going to be full when the doors are shut and people are going to want to get in and it's too late. You can't shop bed and bath anymore. You got to go online. You can't shop Johnny Toy Stores or Toys R Us. All of these places are shutting down. They're going bankrupt. Why? Because people quit visiting them. Churches are going under. Why? Because people have quit visiting them. They don't understand. Yes, God doesn't live here. We bring him here. He's, my verses, they left me. Okay, and pleasing to God. What? This is my true, your true worship. What is worship? Not staying where I was, but going to where God wants me to move to. That is worship. Okay? Verse number two. Be not conformed to this age. You know what he's saying? I know some people will say, do not be, uh, the King James says, do not be conformed to this world. Okay? I like this age. You want to know why? Because what's, in the 1700s, they used to do certain things. And what did the people do? They started conforming to it. The 1800s, things changed. What did they do? They conformed to it. The 1900s came about, and what happened? It started changing, and it started changing a lot and very quickly from about the 1950s on. It just started like every day was almost like a new change. And what did people do? We got to change with the times. What did the churches do? We got to keep up with the times. And the churches started changing. He says, do not be conformed to this age. And what's happening? Every generation is starting to change and conform to what is the new fad. You say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, let's go back. I met my wife in 1966. I was 12 years old. Okay? She was 11. Not in 1966, you weren't. good in math. Math is mine. She's good in English. <laughs> okay. But I met her in 1966. Okay. What was in in 1966? Go-go boots, short skirts. Guess what she wore? Oh, yeah. Go-go <laughs> boot, boots and short skirts got my attention. And it did. She was beautiful then and beautiful now. We, we need to go get some go-go boots and a miniskirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. Okay, so what happened? They started changing. Well, go-go boots are, if you look at it, they're still in. They just don't call them go-go boots anymore. You see a lot of women still walking around with these boots, and now they've got them up over their knees, okay? And back then, high heels were about like this. Now, they're about a foot high. I, ha I have no idea how you can walk in those suckers. You know, that's crazy, but they do it. And now you look at, look at how, 
Look at how eight and nine-year-old little girls dress. First of all, eight and nine-year-old little girls anymore do not look like eight and nine-year-old back when I was growing up. They say it's the preservatives and everything else we got into food. I don't know what it is, but something is changing. And what happens? As parents, we start getting our kids what all of the other kids have. It doesn't matter where it's taking them to. And now what are they doing? Everything is going to AI, AI, AI. So you don't even know if that's really the person that you're looking at singing the song or if it's them taking that person's voice and putting their image on it. You don't even know newscasters anymore are going away. All of, the, all of the news is going to be artificial. And you won't even know where it came from and who's done it. But can I also tell you that almost every one of the protests that are going on is all supported by left-wing socialists, led by one gentleman, very heavy into it, by the name of George Soros, who is not just in America. This is all around the world. He started over there, and now he's coming here. And the problem is he is doing exactly what was said. We cannot conquer the United States by power. The way to conquer the United States is change them one generation at a time, and let's start with the kids. They started in 1950, 1960, starting with the kids coming into elementary schools and started changing their beliefs. 1970, 1980, 1990, and so forth and so on, and they keep changing everything. They don't teach meeting, meeting and man, and, and they don't, they do no longer teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's some Google gobbly garbage that nobody even recommend, recommends or recognizes. So let's go. Okay? So, some of the things that we need to do is he's telling us that we need, to, we need to be in pursuit of something. And so if we're in pursuit of what it is that God's trying to get us to do, we need to know the truth. He told us to worship in spirit and in truth. So what is the truth? We talk about Jesus, but we need to do something. And, and that is this. We need to start learning how to experience the abundant life that Christ has came to give us. Christians, you should not, should not, should not despise being a Christian. May I say this to you? Every Christian should be happy. No, you don't understand. I got a lot of mess going on in my life. What does Paul say? Paul says, I learned, therefore, to be content no matter what the situation is, whether it be good or bad. I have learned one thing, and that is this, that if I'm in a good situation, Jesus is with me. If I'm in a bad situation, Jesus is with me. If I'm in an in-between situation, Jesus is with me. Guess what? I have learned to be content. Why? Because Jesus is always with me. It doesn't matter the situation. The situations are going to change. I cannot let the situation change me. I got to allow Jesus change me and change the situation. Yeah, I know. It's saying I have detected that you have fallen and can't get up. <laughs> It does not like the shaking of my arm. The next thing you know, 911 is going to be called. Turn that off. Well, maybe. Cool. Next thing I know, man, police will be dragging me out of the pulpit. It was me. It was me, you know. 
Uh, remind me next week if I get excited to turn on, take my watch off, okay? Do you remember, uh, some of you maybe uh, around my age, when my kids were growing up, they came out with these little thing called transformers. Remember them? They were, they were really nice looking cars, all souped up. And they really looked nice. And the next thing you know, that car would transform into some figure. And it wasn't always good. There were some bad transformers, you, you know, and, and, and there were some that were good. And so they, they, would begin, they would begin to change, okay? And so they brought out these movies and everything. And so these cars would, would transform into, into some super hero that had these extraordinary abilities. And what it was trying to help us to understand is that you can take just ordinary vehicles and transform them into something very or extraordinary. May I say to you, that is Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. What does he do? He takes us that are just ordinary people. And he takes his supernatural abilities that he has and he changes us from something that is just ordinary into something absolutely extraordinary. Every one of us, there is not one of you sitting in this congregation this morning that does not have extraordinary superpowers if you got Jesus. That's why, that's why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength in Philippians 4.13, I believe it is. It is Christ through me, not me. Get out of the way and let him transform you into what he wants us to do. And listen, I believe that Jesus wants to do the same thing in every one of you, every one of us. And so what's happened is we are so tempted to walk and conform to what the world wants us to do. It's like, what's the new fad? A new restaurant comes into town. Somebody tries it out, and they like it. So what do you do? I go there too, and I get there, and I eat the food, and I said, this is the lousiest place I've ever been in my life. What is it about this restaurant that they like? Their taste and my taste is different. Okay? You might like a great Mexican restaurant, okay, that's very hot and spicy. My, my son loves Chewy's. My wife loves Chewy's. I hate Chewy's. I love Tex-Mex, but I don't like a lot of Tex-Mex because it's too spicy. And my body can't handle spicy food. But I'll tell you what, you give me a good ice cream parlor that comes in, and I'll go to that. <laughs> but those of you that are lact lactose intolerance, you're not going to like it, okay? Because why? We have two different tastes, two different bodies that, that have certain things that we like and appeals to us and everything. And guess what? Jesus knows that. He knows that. So what he's saying is, don't run your life based upon someone else, okay? There may be good things about me that you might want to pick up, but there may be some things about me that you may not want to pick up, okay? And so what we need to understand is what Jesus is trying to do, and he's trying to teach us here in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 3, he is trying to teach us math. In this, in this verse, he is talking about subtracting something and adding something to what you subtracted in its place so that the output it's going to be something that you're going to be proud of what you get in the end. So, what does he want us to subtract? 
the very first thing that he wants us to subtract in here is, remember uh, Ronald Reagan? Some of y'all were alive during then, I think, right? When he was the president in the 1980s, right? Remember that? And they, fight, they declared war on drugs. And they got us, they brought out the campaign slogan, just say no. Right? Yes, his wife was the one that was in charge of it. This was the thing, just say no. May I say this to you? She did not think of that slogan. God did. God is trying to tell us to say no to the world. The world is coming after you. And what he's trying to say is you've got to say no to the world, okay? And the patterns of the world. Let me say, I, I, I told you this last week. I will use this illustration again. I learned one thing. And, and I learned this in the ninth, in the, really in the ninth grade. It was really beat into me. I was running track, okay? And there were four of us. We were the fastest four on the track team. And so we, we ran uh, basically, it's uh, 440 or, yeah, 440 and the 880 relays. And in the ninth grade, we set the record for Butler County. That's how fast I was, okay? Today, I might set the record for the geriatric group, <laughs> but, not for, but not for a 14 or 15-year-old. And we learned. We didn't have headphones, but you learned how to run by somebody Besides you, counting a cadence. So it would, they would get you in that cadence, okay? What ends up happening is you get that cadence and that rhythm in your mind. And you can get that cadence and that rhythm in your mind that you are running so much that your side begins to hurt and you can run through the pain. Because all you hear is the cadence. Let me say this to you. Every one of our lives, God has built into it a rhythm, a pattern. And every one of us, the pattern is going to be different. For instance, when we begin to start looking at these uh, at these patterns. Some of these patterns are unhealthy. They're not good for you. Okay? Some of these patterns that you've set, for instance, um, Lisa was at our house for a couple of weeks. Okay? And her and my wife, because my wife was kind of sitting around not allowing to do anything. So they started, they, they loved playing these coloring games together. I would go out and come back three hours later and they would still be there playing these coloring games. And I would hear 79, 64. Oh, I'm winning. You know, I'm never going to, you're never going to catch up and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, man alive. And so Lisa said, you know, when I go home, I'm going to have to limit this to two hours. How you doing? Not bad? But you want to know how many hours a day they were doing it? Now, some of you are saying, I can't believe that they spent three or four hours on their, on their phone. Sometime you need to look at how much time you spend on this. Not just coloring. How much time, let it keep track of your time. And you'll find out we spend too much time on this thing. 
you know what they they did a survey the average person checks their phone checks their phone at least 100 times in an hour that's the average So there are some that are less and there are some that are more. There are some people that have this thing tattooed to their face. It's like right there so that as soon as something comes up, boom, boom, boom. And they've got 28 conversations going on at once. And you know what happens? They just told someone that they loved them and they found out that that's somebody else's husband that they were talking to because they sent the wrong person A message. And he writes back, (laughs) does your spouse know this? But we've got these problems right now. And, And so what we need to understand, what we need to understand is when we allow sin to start creeping back into our lives, we're not saying no to the world. We're allowing it to continue to go. And so what happens is some of you right now, or let's just say some of us, let's just conclude it's all. This is a blanket statement. Some of us, maybe all of us right now, probably have something unhealthy in our life, rhythm that we need to get rid of. And we need to take it to God and let him do those things. So what do we do? We've just got to learn to say no. So, okay, if I'm going to take and subtract something, then I've got to add something. And so if I'm saying no to something, then I've got to say yes to something. And so once I'm able to locate what that is in my life that I need to get rid of, then I know how to start doing something. Let's just pretend for just a moment that these are not artificial, but rather that these are real flowers. Now, if these were real flowers, and I bought them, and they were in bloom, beautiful foliage, everything's great, and I just sat them here, what would happen? Eventually, the flowers begin to wither. The foliage begins to turn brown. And eventually, there will be no roots. And this will die. But if, if I take care of this every day, every day I set time aside to water this, and as it begins to grow, there are sometimes that you need to snip a branch or some of the foliage off in order for this to bloom more and grow more. May I say this is what Jesus does for us. He waters us with his word every day. So why? So that the things in our life that need to be cut, we can cut it off not to die, but to live. Not to be ugly, to be beautiful, and to maintain that. So what do I do? I say no to the world, but yes to the way. What is the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. So if I'm saying no to the world, I'm getting rid of all those patterns. I'm not trying to be like the world, but I'm saying yes to the way. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to become more and more like Jesus every day. And when I become more and more like Jesus, I'm getting closer and closer to going home. Why did Jesus 
come to earth. It was a nice space trip. Just stop off somewhere, you know? I I just need to visit this civilization that I've created. And so I just need to see how they're doing. He came here for a reason and a purpose. When did he leave here? When he fulfilled his purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, God created you and I for a purpose here on this earth. You want to get out of here? Fulfill your purpose. It's that stinking easy. We make it so difficult. What is God's will in my life? God's will in my life is that I become Jesus. So that, why? When people look at me, they don't see me, they see Jesus. They don't see my imperfections, but rather they see his perfections. Does that mean I'll always be perfect? One second after I'm finished, I'm done. Why? Because the imperfection is gone, and the only thing left is all of the perfection that God's been doing. And when we talk about perfection, I'm not talking about not doing things wrong. I'm talking about maturity. Maturity. The more and more that I put yes into my life, the more mature this sucker is going to ripen and be absolutely adorable. And I'm not talking about the way I look outside. I know it's good. It's, it's, it's aging to perfection, you know? Okay. Forgot to shut this sucker off. Okay. Um, give me Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, if you would, please. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked? Or if I could say advice of the world or the advice of some of the people in the pulpits. These people that are, that are giving you this prosperity religion, uh, this other stuff, name it and claim it. Be careful what you're naming, okay? Or stand in the pathway with sinners. Does that mean that I can't, that I can't hang around with sinners? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that when you're in a crowd with sinners, they can't tell a difference between you and them, okay? In the pathway with sinners, or sit, or sit in the company of mockers. There's a lot of people that I know that used to say that they were Christians, that that today I don't even believe in God anymore. Oh, buddy. You're going to believe one of these days. And, it may, and, you, and they're going to say, well, I got saved when I was a little kid because I went to vacation Bible school. The preacher got up there and said, here's this prayer that you're going to say, and you're going to raise your hand and say, I said this for the first time, and if you said this for the first time, Jesus has come into your life, and you're, you're saved, and now what can I do? Oh, you're saved. Saved from what? Saved from having to go back to vacation Bible school and say that prayer again. That's what I'm saved for. Instead, his delight is in what? Is in the world, is in the Lord's instructions. There's a lot of Christians that don't like what Jesus is telling them to do. You know what? It is, it is awesome when Jesus tells you something to do and he gives you instructions and you do it. And it's like, you gotta be kidding me. How did I know? How did I miss this sucker? And, and what? And he meditates it on day and night. How, when was the last time that you meditated day and night on something that God told you to do? Most of you, it lasts five minutes. Like your mama said, in one ear and out the other. It, no, let it take root, honey. You're going to love it when stuff starts growing in your head. It's called hair. 
<laughs> okay? But what, what was David? David, now look at this. David was a murderer. David was an adulterer. David was a liar, a cheat, was not a good example for his family. But God said David was a man after his own heart. You know what and why God said that? Because David learned the lesson. He finished his life correcting what he made the mistakes of in his early life. You will find David when he finally decided, and you'll see him saying this, that he meditated on the Lord's word day and night. He meditated on it. Why? What does Romans tell us to do? Be you not conformed to this world, but be you rather transformed. How do I do that? By the changing of the mind. What is that? Meditating, meditating, meditating on his word day and night. Okay? And this purpose or, or, or this transformation will only occur if you allow God to do it. So what is the third thing? I've learned to subtract the world, say no to the world. What have I added? I've added saying yes to the word. So what will this help me to do? How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but I know there are many of you that are sitting in this congregation right now that are questioning, what is my purpose? What am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? You want to know why? You've got to say no to the world, yes to his word, and ladies and gentlemen, if you will say yes to his word, you will discern your purpose. I will guarantee you. I did not understand this until 1994 when I went through experiencing God in my verse. I looked to see where the Father is working and I go to join him. What is my purpose? My purpose is the same purpose as to Jesus, to see where the Father's working and go join him. Not what I want to do, but what does he want to do through me? So what is my purpose? It's very simple. I'm not talking about what is your gift. I'm talking about what is your purpose. Your gifts are given to you in order to fulfill the purpose. But unless you know what your purpose is, you will never ever understand what your gift is that you have got. What is my purpose? My purpose is not to get through life. My purpose is to, no matter where I'm at, no matter what situation, no matter what's happening to me, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how much my life is up, down, or all around, my purpose is always, 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 always to magnify Jesus Amen. and give glory to God. That is my purpose. Can I do it when I'm crying? Absolutely. 
Can I do it when I'm laughing? Absolutely. Do, can I do it when I'm in a mediocre mood? Absolutely. Can I do it at home? Yes. Can I do it at church? Yes. Can I do it in the stores? Yes. Can I do it on a cruise ship? Yes. I can do it anywhere. It is not confined. Quit allowing Satan to tell you that you're in a bad mood and get Jesus out of you. You need to tell him, I'm in a bad mood. You're kicked out of here, sucker. I can be in a bad mood. I would rather be in a bad mood with Jesus than a bad mood with you, dude. It's a better bad mood. Okay? It's cool. I am have a rough time in life. I would rather have a rough time in life with Jesus than with Satan. Okay? He's good company. Okay? He really is good company. In the book of Joel, he was talking to the people there. In, in Joel chapter 2 and verse number 12, he says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. God is saying to us, ladies and gentlemen, we are not too far gone to start praying and fasting and mourning. I hear everybody say, boy, if we could just go back to the good old days. The good old days were not the good old days. The good old days are the days ahead of us. All of these are behind us. And, and may I say this to you? I do not want to relive one moment of my past. Because in those moments, I did something wrong and something right. I hope that I keep living in the moment that God has given me and learning from that what it is that he wants us to do. I, I told you my story. My story was I was a little kid that was always taught that it didn't matter whether my mom and dad went to church, I was going to church. They always made sure. Mostly my mom. If it was left up to my dad at that point in time, my dad would have said, y'all can stay home. But my mom always said, nope, you're all going to church. I'm going to make sure you go to church. So we did. I, I, I was a uh, Pentecostal, First Baptist, Second Baptist, independent, non-denominational, Church of Christ, um, heathen. <laughs> because going, even going to church did not change my bad moods or my, my bad habits, okay? Because I, I was always hanging around with the wrong people. And, and we were always bored trying to find something to get into. Until one day, my dad got saved. And from that moment, I was, I was reminded this week, I was talking to someone, and, and we're going to finish and we'll have an invitation here. I was reminded of something. For the longest time, I, I had forgotten uh, a, a very intricate part of my life for some reason, and I, I, I don't know why. But all I could ever remember was my dad walking you know, five of us children at home at that time um, across the bridge to church. And somebody would pick us up or every once in a while my mom would, my mom would drive and we would always go to church. But I had forgotten something. It wasn't just my dad. There was a lady that lived about three houses down from us. She had gotten saved, but her husband had never gotten saved. And what would happen is she would go out and get all of, the, all of these other kids on the block. And we all became real good friends with each other. And we've all kind of reunited on Facebook and, and we talk to each other all the time. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, 
have lost their spouses. They've lost their parents. They've lost brothers and sisters too. And, and I was talking to one of them this week and she reminded me, I had said something about uh, my childhood and everything. And she says, yeah, I remember how every one of us kids would be lined up like by twos and walked across this bridge to this church. A very inquisitive little kid that would drive everybody nuts, I told you that, until one day, one day, I had a Sunday school teacher who listened to that little boy and said, here, let me share this with you. And VBS came along right after that. And on a Thursday of the first week of, two, of a two-week vacation, I cannot tell you the day, I can just tell you it was a Thursday night in the month of June of 1964 that I gave my life to the Lord. It hasn't always been easy and I haven't always walked right and straight but the best decision that I ever made was giving my life to him. Why? It has transformed me completely. Completely. If I hadn't done that, there's a lot of my friends that never did. Most of them have already gone home because they led a lot in the block that we grew up on, it was a rough block. And you went one way or the other. And a lot that went the other ended up in jail, prison, or dead. But a lot of the others are still, are still serving the Lord. I say this to you that you, real to, you really need to think this morning. We're going to play an invitation. I brought in a guest today. And I need you to ask yourself this question. Have I really given my life to the Lord or not? Have I allowed him to transform me or I'm still the same way? So let's stand.